begin with a little funny story this morning. Tommy was uh, doing a Christmas play with his mother sitting in the front row of church. And uh, she was prompting him on what he was supposed to say and uh, gesturing and forming the words uh, silently with his lips. Uh, but he got to a part and it didn't help. Her, uh, Tommy's memory just went totally blank. And finally, she leaned forward and whispered, I am the light of the world. Tommy beamed. And with a great feeling and a loud voice, clearly said, My mother is the light of the world. <laughs> uh, you know, Tommy was real sincere. But in that sense, he was wrong. Well, Jesus is the light of the world. But we are prone to bear that light. And we don't understand, it's hard for us to recognize what it was like prior to the birth of Jesus. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 2 tells us that the prophet looked ahead uh, to a time when the Savior would be born. It talked about the darkness of people. It says, the people that walk in darkness have seen a great light and they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them the light has shined. Now that hadn't happened yet, but when God uh, gives a prophecy or a promise, it's as good as done. Amen. And so for Him, it was already done, even though it hadn't taken place yet. And that's just a good word for somebody here today, is that when God gives a promise, it's as good as done. Uh, so the darkened world anticipated the light's arrival, longed for it. Uh, on down into uh, Luke chapter, uh, well, Zachariah, Zachariah, Zacharias, I'm sorry, the father of John the Baptist, he also anticipated the coming of the Savior of the world. He said in Luke chapter 1, verse 78, 79, he says, through the tender mercies, this is not only over here, of our God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited us. This refers to the Lord Jesus. Uh, that word day spring could also be translated the dawn, the light coming forth after the darkness. It says, to give light to them that sit in darkness, he said, and in the shadow of death to guide our feet unto the way of peace. And then later after Jesus was born, His parents carried Him to the temple. And in Luke chapter 2, verses 28 and following, Simeon, He was the old man that uh, had received a promise from God. And He was a constant in the temple. And uh, He took the baby Jesus in His arms. And He praised God. He said, Now Master, talking to the Lord, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised. For my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all the people a light for the revelation or for the declaration, for the uh, clarity to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. See, Jesus came to his own. And they were supposed to receive him and then spread him with the whole world. But they refused. But Simeon uh, looked forward to that light coming. And so Christmas is the season of light and Jesus is the light of the world. And so I want to look at today my primary text. And this is uh, about nine verses. John chapter 1. We'll read this together this morning. In the beginning was the Word. Now, some people don't understand what that means, but the Word <coughs> is the expression of God. You remember in the book of Genesis, God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, let, and He talked about all the different parts of creation each day, and by His expression, all of that came into being. Well, Jesus is the expression of God. His ex 
expressed. And he became the living Word of God. Let's read it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. That means he had no beginning. And uh, the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. That means uh, at the very foundations of the world. And apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. Life was in him, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. He goes on to say, There was a man named John who was sent from God. He came as a witness to testify about that light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light. Just like Tommy's mother was not the light. But he came to testify about the light the true light who gives light to everyone who is coming into the world. And so Jesus was born for everyone so everyone could have light. So in the next few minutes, I want to quickly, I want to have to do it quickly because I have a lot of notes this morning. So I mean, you all got to get to your ears and really tune in and listen and high gear with me, okay? Okay. Um, so I want to talk about some attributes of the light of Jesus. And we'll pull it from the attribute of light. What do we know about light? First of all, light is pure. Jesus came into the world and he was not of the world. He was not born like any other human. Mary conceived in her womb by the Holy Spirit. Light can never be defiled. You know what? You can't defile light. It can't be corrupted. No matter what passes through it, or no matter what falls upon it, it can't be defiled or corrupted. Then you can take water from the purest spring, but as it bubbles up and it flows over the rocks and down into the creeks. Guess what happens to the water? It takes on pollution. It takes on uh, contaminants. But but light is not like that. It's like you can take snow, pure as it could possibly be, be as it falls, but before long that snow becomes corrupted. But not the light. Light can never be the fire. Now, sometimes we get excited about snow falling. And it's beautiful to look at falling. But after it's been on the ground a few days, it starts looking kind of yucky, doesn't it? Well, that's not the way the light is. It's never defined. Jesus is the light of the world. He exposed sin, but He was never contaminated by sin. He retained His quality. Um, Jesus could touch sinners, but sin could never touch Jesus. Now that's worth writing down. Jesus could touch uh, sinners, but sin could never touch him. He was absolutely pure, absolutely sinless. He was in the world, but he was not of the world. He came to expose sin, but he was never contaminated. Why? You say, well, what about smoke or clouds? Well, the light's still there. And once those clouds uh, blow away or the smoke, if you burn stuff in your house, you, what's the first thing you do? You turn on the fans and open the door or the windows. Once you get that smoke out of the house, it's, it's just as light as it was before without contaminants. And so light is pure. Second thing I want to say about light today, and as we think about Jesus, light is constant. It's constant. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And when He came here to live on this earth, the Word took on flesh, and we beheld His glory, verse 14 says in that chapter. He was uh, constant. 
He was the same quality in heaven as he was obeying in the manger. Now, your babies don't stay the same quality. What happens to them after they start growing a little bit? <laughs> they get mean. They get selfish. They sin. They, parents, this may be our shaking for you, but your young child will manipulate you. <laughs> they can manipulate you. Now, I'm not talking about any one of my children. <laughs> I'm just saying children as a whole. They don't stay like they come out of the winter. <laughs> Thank you, sister. Testify to that. But God has never gotten any worse, and He's certainly never going to increase in value or get any better. God is constant, and Jesus is, is God. He's constant. Uh, he's the same today as He was when He was born in that manger, when He died on the cross, when He resurrected from the grave, when He ascended back into heaven, where the Bible says He ever lives, making intercession for the saints. In fact, He's praying for you this morning. If you know Him, He's praying for you. Every time that you breathe a prayer, Jesus is right there, and He's uh, telling God the Father, this one's with me. Listen to what He's saying. He makes intercession. He intercedes on our behalf. God can't change. He's absolutely unchanging. Malachi 3.6 I am the Lord. I change not. Seven words that sums up God in this thing. He doesn't change. Now you may change. You may mess up a lot. I'm talking about you may go off the deep end. But He doesn't change. And guess what else? His love doesn't change for you. And if you're His blood-bought child, your salvation doesn't change. Aeronautical engineers know that in calculating travel, there must be at least one constant. You have all the other variables, but you've got to have one constant. You may know what that constant is. It's the speed of light. 186,282 miles per second. That's the constant. And when Einstein... Uh, recorded the theory of relativity, that was the constant that the whole equation worked on. See, Jesus is the one constant that does not change. I don't know about you, but I need something in my life that does not change. Because my boss may change the way I can fall in and out of favor with a relationship. Your bank account can change. Your home status can change. A lot of things can change. But God is constant. And His love for you is constant. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and means before you knew him, he's the same now as he was then. And he'll be the same forever. No wonder this hymn writer wrote, Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow nor turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. God 
time doesn't change. So the lie is pure, the lie is constant. Let me give you one more. I'm trying to move along pretty quick. Lie cannot be overcome. You can't overcome lie. Verses 3 through 5 in our text, let me kind of uh, review it for you again. All things were created through Him and apart from Him. Not one thing was created that has been created. In Him was life. And that life was the light of men that shines in the darkness. And yet the darkness did not overcome it. One translation says the darkness could not put it out and cannot put it out. Another translation says, the darkness cannot extinguish it. No matter what happens. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but there's been a battle going on throughout the ages. A battle between light and darkness. Between good and evil. God and those who follow the God of the darkness. That's Satan. Did you know that Satan was named Lucifer? And he was uh, called the Son of the Morning, I think was his name, uh, what it meant. But it really literally means light bearer. One who bears light. He was created to bear light. But he turned against God. He wanted God's glory. He, he wanted what belonged only to God. And he sinned against the light. And now no longer is he the light bearer. Lucifer has become Satan. He's the father of the night. You young people, nothing good happens late at night. Nothing good happens late at night. Parents, I might need to tell you that too. Because you let your kids stay up all night playing video games and online. Nothing good happens late at night. You say, that's just your opinion. Take it for what it's worth. I've seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of lives. Darkness battles to overcome the light. But darkness has absolutely no power against the light. If you're in a dark room and you want to get the darkness out, what do you do? You turn on the light. It erases the darkness. When you turn on the light, where does the darkness go? It flees. It's, it's, it's not there. It can't stay. Darkness is totally powerless against the light. I want you to know Satan is totally powerless against the light of Jesus. And so our best defense is to call upon Jesus when we're tempted. Because Satan is powerless against him. And his forces are. Darkness can't put out the light. On the brightest moonlit night, the light of the moon, listen to this, is only one uh, one hundredth. I'm sorry, one eight hundred thousandth as bright as the ordinary sun on a shining day. It means it's minuscule. And like us, we should shine the light of the sun. You can block out the light, but you can't put it out. Day sleepers know about this. You can get you the blackest, what do you call those, sleep masks. You can put up all the blinds. You can do everything you can do. But you can't block out the line. You can't. You might block it out of your room, but you can't put it out. It's still there. You can walk in a room and turn on the light, but you cannot walk in a room and turn on darkness. You ever try to do that? You can turn on the light, but you can't turn on darkness. The only thing that can let darkness in is for the light to be brought out. So, light is pure. 
Life is constant. Life cannot be overcome. To give you uh, one more, life is vital to life. Verse 4 of our text said, In Him was life, and life was what? The light of men. Jesus is the light of men. And when God created light, what was the first thing He made after uh, in creation? He made the what? And then the sun. And the moon. One to rule the day. One to rule the night. And you know, ever since that time when He said, let there be light, light and life have been interwoven. You cannot have life unless you have light. That's why Jesus said men love darkness because their deeds are evil. When God brought light to a chaos, He made it a line. Because when the light came, guess what happened next? The seas began to swarm with, li with life, living things. It was a part natural order of creation. It began to swarm with living things and plants began to grow. The trees and the seeds began to bud and blossom. Now I'm going to take you back a few years. How many of you, probably in about 6th or 7th grade, <coughs> science in school, how many of you remember studying photosynthesis? I can't say it, but I remember what it is. Photosynthesis. The word photo means light. The synthesis I can't say it with this. I got a partial one. I can't say it with that. It means to put together. So grow, growing things are put together with life. Photosynthesis. That's how they come together. Light causes plants to produce. Anybody know the chlorophyll? Yeah, remember the green leaves, the chlorophyll? Light causes the plants to produce chlorophyll and the whole life chain is built upon the sunlight. You see, light is vital to life. And this is the same for you and I. It's the same for a darkened world. That's why we must tell the world who Jesus is. That's why we must tell the world that He is the light of the world. And I have seen the light. If you take someone away from our world, what would happen? It, it'd be dead. It's like a man without Jesus. He becomes cold and dark and dead. Same thing would happen naturally to this world without light. But Jesus said, I am the light of the world. It's pretty cool. Uh, this morning I heard Mike ask what a metaphor was. What was the answer? You don't remember? No. <laughs> but what a metaphor that Jesus used there to explain what it meant to have life. See, light and life always go together. Do you want to put life back into, into uh, you and put your life back together? Put the light in you. It's a divine photosynthesis that takes place when you hear or read God's Word. When you come to the understanding that that baby in the manger is who he said he was. The incarnate God. And that man on the cross is the same one and he was hung on the cross for you and I because he was who he said he was. And because he was who he said he was, he resurrected from the grave. That's Hallelujah. 
Psalm 119, verse 130 says, The entrance of your word gives light. When we begin to dig into God's word or read God's word or hear God's word, He gives light to our life. Verse 105 of that same psalm says, Your word is a lamp unto my what? feet and a light unto my Man. You know, hey, y'all did pretty good on that. <coughs> Jesus is the light, and your cold, dark, dead world will be put back together when you put Jesus in your life. <coughs> and what better time than the season of life to do that thing? I'm so happy for you. So happy for you, Beth. To see your lives change this, this Christmas season. And I'm so happy for all of you because I've had the privilege of watching you grow in the life of God's Word. And watching God put your life back together in the glorious light of His Son as He shines in your heart. When you get saved, the Lord turns the light on and life begins again. Amen. Amen. It happened to you, Tommy. I've seen it. Well, I better hurt. I spent a lot of time on that one. Light reveals what you cannot see in darkness. Light reveals what you can't see in darkness. Verse 14 of that, that first chapter of John. Skip on down in your text. The Word became flesh. And I like this version. It says He took up residence among us. He dwelled with us. And we beheld or observed His glory. The glory as the one and only Son from the Father. King James or New King James uses the word begotten. And the word begotten, where else have you heard that before? John 3.16. You know what begotten means? Is the only one of his kind. The only one of his kind. There was, there's never going to be another God man born into this world. That's why the, Paul said, There is no other name given unto heaven whereby man must be saved. Where's that at? I forgot. Eight. Verse 12. I don't remember what chapter. Romans 8. Somebody had to tell me, I can't remember. I draw a blank, but I don't have it written down. But he says, He's the only begotten one, the only Son from the Father. And he says He was full of grace and truth. Truth. We need truth. But aren't you thankful for grace? Amen. When the truth leaves us in need, grace steps in. And gives us what we cannot earn. Glory, as is used in that passage, is the outshining of the light of His grace and truth. It is the light of God that's in Jesus. We, we have lights in this building. It's artificial illumination. But it can never match the sunlight. Even the bright LCD lights that we see uh, in that they've come out with now, they don't match the light of the Son. Jesus is the only one that reveals the glory of God. Christ is the one who gives glory and joy and victory to us. And that's why in the third chapter, He says, you are the light of the world. And He reminds them that a light is not put under the bushel. It's not hidden, but it's put so everyone can see. Everyone can benefit from it. And so Jesus is why we celebrate Christmas. I mean, all the other stuff is good. We like it all. But Jesus is the real, as I used to say, the reason for the season. 
If you don't know Jesus, I want you to know I know something you don't know. And I see things that you can't see. And they're wonderful. And you can only know it and experience it when you know Jesus. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 says, But if we walk in the light as He Himself is the light, we have fellowship with who? One another. We have a shared experience. That's what fellowship means. It doesn't mean you want to sit down and eat together. Even though that can be a shared experience. But it's a shared experience of life. We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, His Son, does what? Say it like you mean it. Cleanses us from all sin. <clears throat> that ought to make a Baptist shout. <laughs> make you act like a Pentecostal. <laughs> the sad thing is, is that many neglect or refuse the lie. Verses 10 through 12 of our text. And it's not on over here, but just listen. It says, He was in the world, and the world was created through Him, and yet the world did not recognize Him. He came to His own, and His own people did not receive Him. But to all who did receive Him, He gave them the right. If you read in the King James, it says the heart. The right is a better expression. I'm not saying this, but I'm not in the King James. I'm saying we can understand what it means to receive a right. He gave them the right to be the children of God to those who believe in His name. And I'm going to close. This is a little kind of lengthy uh, illustration. Take me in. During World War II, there was an aircraft carrier that was in danger of enemy submarines. They were in the North Atlantic. And in the darkness of night, the captain sent out five pilots to see if so they could somehow spot those enemy submarines. Later, the captain realized how much danger that they themselves were in. And he gave a command. He said, let every light on the ship be extinguished. There was to be a total blackout on the ship. Well, later the five pilots returned. And one radio said, we're coming home. Give us some light to land by. The radio operator said, I'm sorry, there's a total blackout. We cannot give you light. Another of the pilots radioed and said, just give us some light and we'll land. Again, the order came back. It's a total blackout. We cannot give you any light. In desperation, one of the pilots radioed back and said, um, just give us one line to help us land by. The radio dispatcher replied with a broken heart, and he said, I cannot give you even a single line. And with that, he shut off, switched to the radio. Those five brave American pilots died. And went down and walked away. And went out into eternity because they had no light. It's crucial for us today that know the light of Jesus, that we let it shine to a dark world. You don't have to know the Roman road, you, you don't have to know a bunch of scriptures to be a witness. All you got to do is be willing to tell what you know about what Jesus has done for you. It'd be good to know some scriptures. Add verse to your life. 
But you know, the witness begins just by telling what you know. It's crucial because we live in a darkened world today. And while we're sitting in a sealed house this morning with light, heat, comfortable chairs, there's a world that doesn't know that Jesus is the light. We trap in the darkness. And they too will perish unless someone tells them. 